Hello and welcome back to Craig Fay Builds a Clock. Is this still a thing? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, listen, here's the thing. I said off the start that the whole point of this was to learn things. And I'm happy to report that one thing I have learned is that taking on a new, complicated, and ambitious project uh, during a global pandemic while confined to a small shared space can be uh, challenging and overwhelming. Uh, so while I certainly had enough time to work on this project, the resources I was lacking was space and sanity. Uh, so hooray for learning. Anyway, as you guessed from the title of this video, the topic of today's episode is the foliate regulator. And this is the foliate regulator. It is a bar of wood with some bolts put through it. And that's, that's it. That's the entire device. Uh, didn't even build this recently. No, it's been done since episode two. You saw it already in episode three. So why does something so simple get its own episode? Well, because the regulator is uh, the last component we need to actually build a functional clock. Uh, arguably, it's the most important, and there is a lot more going on with the physics of this than are apparent at first glance. We saw back in episode three that the crown wheel and the verge escapement convert the spinning motion of the power source into alternating motion, swinging back and forth. That tick tock or the beat of a clock is what allows us to tell time. But as with anything we're trying to measure, standardization is important. We don't want our big, ugly mess of a clock measuring time in whatever beat it happens to produce. We want to be able to control or regulate it uh, so that it is some useful fraction of a minute or a second. And that's exactly what the foliate regulator does. It's attached to the ver shaft and controls the speed at which it swings back and forth. Without changing anything else on the clock, we can fine tune the clock by sliding the bolts back and forth in this slot. Moving them all the way to the end makes the clock beat slower and pulling them close in makes the clock beat faster. Put another way, it's changing the amount of time it takes to complete one back and forth oscillation. To understand how it's actually doing this, let's take a step back and look at all of the things that actually affect how long it takes something to move somewhere. So imagine you're on the side of the road, your car has run out of gas, and you have no other option but to push that car to the nearest gas station. And by the way, uh, physicists love to make f uh, fun little assumptions like this, like pretending cell phones don't exist or uh, roadside assistance hasn't been invented yet. It's, uh, it's a whole thing. Anyway, how long is this gonna take you to push your car to the gas station? The first thing you'll want to know is how far away is the gas station? How far do I have to push it? Pushing the car 10 meters is going to take a lot less time than pushing it 10 kilometers. So the amount of time it takes something to move somewhere depends on the distance it has to move. The next thing we need to worry about is how big the vehicle is you're trying to push or how much mass it has. It will take less time to push a little tiny moped than a fully loaded truck. The amount of time it takes to move something also depends on the mass of whatever you're trying to move. And the final thing we need to consider is how hard you are able to push the vehicle. Are you pushing it by yourself or do you have a bunch of passengers on their way to a strongman competition who can help you out? Pushing with a small force is going to take way more time than pushing with a big force. If you want, you can take the expression force equals mass times acceleration. You can do some fancy first year calculus and find the exact relationship between all of these. Um, but you probably don't want to do this, so here it is. It is the square root of two times the mass multiplied by the distance divided by the force. The important part to notice that as mass and distance go up, time goes up, and as force goes up, time goes down, exactly like we thought before. Of course, with clocks, things aren't moving down a road in a straight line. They're rotating, they're moving in circles. 
But a cool part about physics is that for everything that affects something moving in a straight line, every term, every variable, there is an analogous term for something that is rotating. And on top of that, they're actually all related to each other. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the foliate regulator and ask ourselves the same question we did about a car being pushed down the road. How long is it going to take to move? Just like the car, it depends on how far the foliate has to travel. Since it's rotating, we don't measure that distance in meters or kilometers. We measure it as part of the angle that it has to rotate through. So for example, it's gonna take a lot less time for the foliate to rotate five degrees than say a full 360. And just like the letter D represented distance, the angle is represented by this symbol. It's theta, it's the Greek letter theta. 90% uh, of the time, if when you see that letter, it means angle, uh, the other 10% of the time you are in Greece. So similarly, the analog of force is torque. So force is a measure of how hard you push or pull something, and torque is a measure of how hard you twist something. You've probably heard about torque before. It's very often mentioned in commercials for trucks, and that's because torque is a measure of how hard the engine can spin the wheels. Not how fast, but how hard. So force and torque are of course related. You create torque anytime you apply a force off center, uh, which you know if you've ever used a wrench, or you would at least know if you've ever used a wrench properly. You push and pull the handle of the wrench applying a force, but because it's offset a certain distance from where you're trying to rotate it, it creates a torque and the bolt spins. So the higher the torque on the foliate, the less time it will take, and the lower the torque on the foliate, the more time it's going to take. Which brings us to mass. So the rotational equivalent of mass is something that's known as the moment of inertia, uh, which we symbolize with the letter I. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, this is a weird one. So mass, we typically think of as how much stuff an object has, and we absolutely can think of it that way, that's correct. But we can also think of mass as the property of matter that resists motion. Uh, similarly, the moment of inertia is the property of an object that resists rotation. And just like torque and force are related, so is the moment of inertia and mass. If you have two solid wheels, one made out of something heavy like say iron, and the other made out of something light like cardboard, you'd probably assume that the one with more mass is going to take more torque in order to get spinning. And you would be correct. Mass does play a part in how much torque is required to get something spinning, but it's not the only consideration. It also matters how that mass is distributed, or put another way, how far away that mass is from the center of rotation. Consider this hammer. So it's much harder to rotate with my wrist when I hold it by the handle than if I were to hold it by the head. So it's the same hammer, they have the same mass, but most of the mass of a hammer is in its head. So the closer I get that mass to the center of rotation, which in this case is my wrist, the lower that moment of inertia and the less torque it's going to take to get it to start to rotate. So the farther away the mass is, the higher the moment of inertia, the closer it is to that center of rotation, the lower the moment of inertia. So taking that all into account, the amount of time it takes our foliate regulator to swing one way is given by this equation. The square root of two times the moment of inertia multiplied by the angle that it rotates through and divided by the torque. So if we wanted to change the period of the clock, we could change any one of those variables. We could change the torque, for example. Uh, the simplest way to do that would be to add or subtract weight from our power source. But adding or removing weight 
is a little cumbersome and it's hard to get just right. Plus, if the torque is too low, it may not have the ability to overcome the friction of the parts, or if it's too high, it may increase wear and tear. Uh, the other thing we could change is the angle that the foliate rotates through. But that's even harder to change than the mass on our power source because that angle is actually fixed by the angle of the paddles and how they interact with the crown wheel. So changing that angle means that we need to completely redesign and rebuild the whole mechanism, which we obviously don't want to do for just small adjustments. And that leaves us with changing the moment of inertia. And that's exactly what the foliate regulator is designed to do. By sliding the weights back and forth on this bar, we're changing how far away they are from the center of rotation. And changing this changes the moment of inertia. Once again, sliding all the weights to the very end means that the foliate is going to slow down and sliding them all the way in will speed it up. So any point in between will give us a period somewhere in between those two extremes. I can also change the moment of inertia by adding or subtracting small amounts of mass on the foliate. By doing this, uh, we can fine tune the swing of the foliate and make it a very specific amount of time. And that's what makes this part so important it's the part of the clock that actually tells time. Regulators like this are arguably the most important part of a clock. Every clock to this day has a regulator. Grandfather clocks are regulated by a pendulum. Quartz wristwatches are regulated by a vibrating piece of quartz crystal. And most advances in clock technology, precision, and accuracy have been due to improvements in the regulator. Uh, the foliate is simply the first and when it was combined with the verge escapement it formed the verge foliate clock. What we've built here and the very first mechanical clock ever to be used. And like the first piece of any technology it sucks. The foliate regulator is really inaccurate. It's so inaccurate in fact that Verge Folia clocks uh, didn't even have displays. They didn't even bother keeping track of minutes. These clocks would simply ring a bell once every hour, or by modern standards, they would ring a bell approximately every hour. That sounds crude to us, but if you're in the Middle Ages and everybody you're dealing with lives in the same town and is going off of the same town clock, it doesn't really matter if one hour is 62 minutes and the next hour is 58. So that's it for the foliate regulator. Hopefully you learned something, uh, I found it interesting. This is sort of the last of the episodes that I had initially planned out when I decided to build a clock. So it actually kind of means a lot to me to finally get this done. There's still lots to do with the clock and lots of other things to learn. So there may be more episodes in the future, but who knows. Uh, thanks for watching everybody. Yeah.